Okay, hi, it's Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our Facebook Live. Today is Wednesday, uh, I think it's the 13th, maybe, and I was just speaking about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors today, just a little bit, um, and in fact, you know, as we're doing the CTSS lectures, we're coming up with a whole bunch of new lectures, so I've been working on different topics for uh, the lecture series, and um, so I'm trying to figure out specifically what people are interested in. Um, I did a couple really new ones, and one of them I did is on neuroendocrine tumors in the pancreas. So I thought I would speak about that a little bit. You'll be able to hear a full talk of that. I'm looking at the calendar, maybe in a couple weeks, maybe a little, maybe about a month. Take it back. Um, one of the things we always speak about in terms of looking at the pancreas, we speak about adenocarcinoma. But as all of you know, probably in practice, we are seeing a lot more neuroendocrine tumors. They used to be infrequent, and I think part of the reason they were infrequent is because we couldn't find them. Remember, if you go back to the CT literature from years ago, you would talk about a 30% detection rate, something like um, insulinomas under 30%, because they were small neuroendocrine tumors. But today's state of the art is we're probably 95% accurate in detection, and in fact, one of the biggest problems is that we're picking up incidental neuroendocrine tumors. We never picked them up before, and if we did, they were very large. Now we're picking them up when they're small because we do lots of arterial phase imaging. And you're picking up things in the one to two centimeter range, for example, maybe even smaller. And so one of the big things, of course, relates to what do you do about them. And uh, there's a lot of work going on in terms of trying to predict behavior of neuroendocrine tumors. They look at some of the chromogranin as one factor, perhaps, grade them into the, you know, the high and low risk, perhaps, is a simple way of doing it. And then people will argue, what should you do with a 2CM lesion incidental or a 1CM lesion incidental? Can you follow the patients? The challenge, of course, is neuroendocrine tumors do develop metastasis. And can you predict what patients are more apt to get metastasis? And if you were, then perhaps you would do surgery very early with the idea that if you take out a one centimeter lesion, perhaps you can prevent a spread of disease. So it indeed becomes very, very important. One of the things long term we are starting is, you know, we're doing this deep learning project uh, going into our third year. Uh, Felix, we're about 90% accurate for picking up pancreatic cancer, and we're going to get better, we're going to get to 100%. And about two weeks ago, we started looking at neuroendocrine tumors, which we're going to look at 500 cases probably over the next three months and see what the detection rate is, particularly for small lesions, and can we compare them to adenocarcinomas. Can we not only detect them, but determine specifically what they are? And using radiomics, can we predict which ones will be more or less aggressive? Can we, based on those nearly 500 different parameters, be able to subselect the different tumors and fit them into categories, not just size. Uh, and we're going to do, we're working with surgery and pathology, look at about 130 cases, about half of them are in the high and half in the low grade, and see can we predict where these lesions will fit in. So I think it's a very, very interesting, interesting project, but it also shows the power of radiomics, assuming we can do it. We have done pancreatic adenocarcinoma versus normal tissue with about a 98% accuracy rate. So this idea about radiomics, um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the Donald Rumsfeld quote after 9-11 or somewhere around that time where he was speaking to reporters, and I'm going to misquote this, so don't get me exactly on this one, but he said, we tend to know what we know. We often know what we don't know, but the challenge is not those two, that's easy. The challenge is we don't know what we don't know. That's very important. I think that's true in medicine. We know a lot about the patient. We know a lot about the disease, but and we know things we don't know. Okay, so that's a good balance. But the truth is we don't know what we really don't know. And you're seeing this with deep learning, you're seeing this with radiomics, where a whole different set of parameters is coming across, and you're really learning about diseases differently, you're learning about ways of making things more accurate and managing patients better. 
I think you're going to look back 10 years from now and basically say that what happened when people looked at CT versus chest X-ray, that even Paul Wheeler, who was the expert chest X-ray reader, said the plain films were a poor first approximation. And I wonder if we're going to reach a point someday where you look at a CT scan, me looking at it, no matter how experienced I am, and you're going to say, well, you're only picking up a little bit of the information. You better use some of those deep learning algorithms. You better look at the radiomics and be able to see what you don't see. When I look at a scan and I say it's normal or I say it's a neurodegenerative tumor, I know what I see. I know what I don't see, but I don't know what I don't know that I should be seeing. And so um, it's not really a play on words, but it's probably a good way of thinking about things. So as people worry about deep learning and uh, artificial intelligence, I think you have to think about that it's only gonna expand our knowledge base, not take away our knowledge. Now with neuroendocrine tumors, I think just several features that I should uh, go over. One is, of course, these are the tumors that typically are best seen arterial phase imaging. May not be seen venous even when they're large. If you only have venous phase or delayed phase imaging, you will routinely miss these lesions. They typically don't obstruct the pancreatic or common duct even when they're large. So arterial phase imaging is the key. We will look and see how much the arterial phase versus the venous phase impacts strategies in terms of management, but from detection, arterial phase rules. In terms of vessel involvement, these lesions do involve vessels, but unlike adenocarcinoma, which encases the sigloiac SM or SMA or encases the SMV and portal vein and kind of surrounds it and narrows it, the, um, on the venous side particularly, neuroendocrine tumors tend to grow directly in. So you see like a meniscus sign going directly into the vessel. So it's a different appearance. Again, I mentioned most of them are hypervascular, but I have seen some that are not hypervascular, and it can be very tricky. Neuroendocrine tumors can obstruct the patient's pancreatic duct, but typically do not. When you do have metastasis, they're very vascular. Now, I will say sometimes vascular meds, once they're treated, are, are become hypovascular. So a lot of what we say about neuroendocrine tumors is at time zero. Once you get some of the chemotherapies, even vascular lesions uh, can be um, can be somewhat uh, isodense with time. Also, with neuroendocrine tumors, it's kind of like very much clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which also gives vascular metastasis. Uh, when you have nodes, the nodes are very vascular, so the positive nodes are usually easy to recognize even when they're small, and that's true with all neuroendocrine tumors, including things like paragangliomas. So arterial phase becomes the key because so many things, particularly when they're small, will only show an arterial phase when you have that basically bright structure, that kind of flashlight, which tends to disappear as you go down into the patient's venous phase imaging. I have been using cinematic rendering. I think cinematic rendering does give you a textural difference between neuroendocrine and adenocarcinomas. And I think I showed that in the presentation. And we are getting what I would consider very promising results in that regard. So I am pretty excited about that. Um, when you think about neuroendocrine tumors, uh, again, in terms of the liver, vascular metastasis, you know, you can have hepatoma that are vascular. You can have metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Uh, but typically, you will see both the liver and the primary tumor. So that's not typically a problem. As I mentioned a few moments ago, once you have therapy, often the metastasis, as well as primary tumor, may become less vascular. So that's typically not an issue. In terms of neuroendocrine tumors, you can see multiple masses. Sometimes they're in large nodes. In terms of multiple tumors, you can't see them. I think the one I think about most is insulinoma. Now, people will say with neuroendocrine tumors, they're all functioning, okay? That's the answer, they're all functioning. Some are hyperfunctioning. And then you think about the glucodenoma, you think about the insulinoma, you think about the VIPoma. So the ones that are part of these syndrome type things, you will see other findings. So for example, gastronomy may see nodes, the classic location, 
around the duodenum and head of pancreas. Um, you think of insulinomas, they're typically smaller in the one centimeter range. But then with insulinomas, you also remember they can be multiple. They can be the most difficult lesions to detect because the patient is small, because the lesions are small. But the history kind of drives you to look very carefully because typically insulinomas are not going to be an incidental finding, but they're going to be somebody with hyperglycemia. So you kind of know this patient probably has an insulinoma, and your job is to find it. So you will be looking very, very carefully at that. Um, in terms of phases, of course, the arterial phase is most critical. We also do venous phase that at times helps with vascular involvement. But truthfully, when you have direct extension into veins, you will see the tumor growing directly and being vascular. But it can be somewhat helpful. Though usually, again, uh, the lesions will be washing out come the venous phase. So it's going to be a little bit different than when you think about adenocarcinoma, perhaps where the venous is really the best phase in the arterial. It's probably not as cool. I mentioned about size. I think the hyperfunctioning lesions tend to be smaller in the classic is insulinoma. When we see non-functioning tumors, and you'll see in my lecture, you can see a lot of lesions that are 5 cm, maybe even larger. Now, one thing about neuroendocrine tumors, they can't calcify. Typically, we think about cystic lesions at central calcification, serous cystadenoma. Um, in um, neuroendocrine tumors, the calcification is more chunky, it's more dense, can be diffuse, but also tends to be more central. Adenocarcinomas essentially don't calcify. If you see adenocarcinomas with calcification, it's typically an adenocarcinoma that arose in a patient who had chronic pancreatitis. Um, occasionally, what else can calcify? Metastasis, maybe a renal cell, exceedingly rare. Spend tumors, solid and papillopathial neoplasms can have rim-like calcification often, but again, that's a 20-year-old female, so you're not going to typically have uh, that, that issue. One other thing to talk about, just in terms of numbers, I'm looking at a chart here as I look down. Neuroendocrine tumors, frequency up to about 15% of cases. Metastasis, pancreas in general, under 5%, and I have a note here for spend tumors up to 50%. But again, the calcifications are coarser with a neuroendocrine tumor, and the more rim-like is what you see in patients who have these spend tumors. So that kind of works out very nicely. Um, it's an important finding, which can indeed be very helpful. We do see faint calcifications now occasionally with um, IPMN, so that also can be helpful. Again, I did mention the cinematic. I recommend those who have cinematic Try it out on the pancreas, both for staging, but also for looking at lesions. It can indeed be very, very helpful. I should mention in terms of differential diagnosis, I said neuroendocrine tumors are very vascular. Occasionally, serous cystadenomas are very vascular around the periphery as vessels are stretched. And then, of course, metastasis, with the most common metastasizing lesion being metastatic renal cell carcinoma, is usually a clear cell, usually a decade plus post-initial treatment, but it can give a vascular met uh, to the pancreas and look very similar to a neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, the history that usually makes the diagnosis is an absent kidney, then you check when the tumor was diagnosed, and it's usually more than a decade ago, so that becomes very easy in that regard. Um, also with neuroendocrine tumors, 90% of them occur sporadically. But there are about 10% uh, occur as part of syndromes. MEN2, MEN1, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1, Ronan Belindau, neurofibromatosis, and tuber sclerosis complex. Okay? And that means you're going to see these, neuro, you see these neurogenic tumors at a relatively earlier age. Um, I have a quote here, Ronan Belindau, uh, only about 10 to 17% of vulnerable in that patients will develop neuroendocrine tumors, but that's still a large amount. Mean age of diagnosis is 29 to 38. So that's something to consider. I mentioned before about all these tumors are functioning, but it's that hyperfunctioning uh, that really is the ones. Those are the insulinomas. I said gastrinomas, glucagonomas, VIPomas, somatostinomas, a lot of very big words. But again, each of them you have to be aware of because it's very much a syndrome. So that becomes indeed very, very important 
to be able to recognize. Um, I think in terms of uh, MEN1, for example, the patient still developed their neuroendocrine tumors in their 50s, so it's not typically going to be so early. One of the things that's interesting, and I won't have time to go through, is I've read a couple of recent papers where you look at the vascularity of a neuroendocrine tumor and you can predict its uh, outcome. Uh, as lesions that hypo enhance on CT tend to have a worse overall survival than those iso enhancing or hyper enhancing. So again, we've talked about this before with certain tumors. Uh, the signature of the tumor on CT can drive you to make the right diagnosis, but also drive you to predict the outcome, I think is very important. And I think we're gonna see a lot of that. Uh, this talk really has some incredible cases. I'm just looking at it. Again, this whole idea about texture features. There is an article from Canalis and AJR this year, CT texture analysis and CT features can be used to predict the neuroendocrine grade according to WHO classification. So there is a lot of information we are gleaning, and this idea about texture mapping uh, indeed can be very, very important. And I put in some images in the talk, which really show this very nicely. Classic CT, axial, multiplanar, 3D, and some of the new cinematic rendering. So that works out very nicely. I'll just also leave you with one last thing. Sometimes neuroendocrine tumors are in the pancreatic duct. They obstruct the duct. These tumors have serotonin, so it's fibrosis that duct down. The lesions are small, and they obstruct the duct. And it's an important diagnosis. You see an obstructed duct. No obvious mass or small mass with enhancement. You got to think about a neuroendocrine tumor, and you'll be able to make that diagnosis in most cases. So my time is up. I don't think anyone's really asked me any great questions. Uh, you, Scott, what can we learn from IBM Watson? I, I don't know. I, I'm not a big fan of IBM. They're putting a lot of money in. I'm not seeing a lot of results, but we shall see. Uh, the companies that seem to be really moving forward, uh, Google with Varany, just coming up a million articles of stuff they're doing. You're seeing some work with Facebook. You're seeing some work now with Apple. You see the Apple Watch yesterday. I don't have one. If Apple wants to give me one, that would be great. But the Apple Watch, um, you know, where you, is FDA approved to look at your EKG. So that becomes very, very important. I think the, um, the deep learning will be very important in terms of... Uh, things like neuroendocrine tumors, this whole idea of detection and management and outcomes will be something that deep learning and uh, artificial intelligence should be good at, improve our detection, improve our classification, determine management, and then by doing that, determine outcome and really guide the patients into the best method of their treatment. So with that, my time is surely now overrun. I'm gonna go back and read some films and I'll see you next week. Have a great week. Take care.